Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Network 2020's discussion about trends in the use of the dollar. So my name is Courtney Dogger and I am the president of Network 2020. Uh, just to give a brief background, very brief background about Network 2020 for everyone, we are a nonprofit organization that's based in New York and we're focused on bridging the gap between the private sector and the international affairs community. We do this through a number of programs, both in person in New York City, as well as research abroad and um, webinars like these. So we're um, very pleased to have with us today two experts who can walk us through a rather complicated and important topic. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, Dr. Barry Eichengreen. He is the George C. Party and Helen N. Party Chair and Distinguished Professor of Economics and Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. He is a Research Associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and Research Fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research. He was Senior Policy Advisor at the uh, International Monetary Fund from 1997 to 1998, and has written several books and been awarded numerous uh, prizes for his work. So we're so pleased to have you with us, uh, Dr. Eichengreen. And we are also pleased to be joined by Daniel McDowell. He is a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center and an associate professor of political science at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. He is a specialist on the international politics of money and finance with a regional emphasis on the US and China. And his most recent book is Bucking the Buck, US Financial Sanctions and the International Backlash Against the Dollar. So all very relevant. Um, uh, Barry and Dan, thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to have you here. So to start, um, Dr. Eichengreen, turning to you, could you please provide us an overview of the historical dominance of the US dollar and its significance in the global economy? Just a, just a small question there. Um, and then also, as, as we talked about in our initial preparatory call, um, could you also explain the difference between a primary international currency and a global reserve currency, just so we're using proper terminology? Sure. So on an international currency is a currency like the dollar that is used for a variety of cross-border transactions to make payments uh, connected with trade, to uh, uh, engaged in cross-border lending and borrowing uh, for central banks and governments to hold as reserves that they can use when they want to uh, provide dollars as lenders of last resort to their own banks and firms that may have borrowed abroad in dollars. So uh, this function as a form of reserves is one aspect of the broader international currency uh, characteristic of the US dollar. You asked me about uh, uh, the history in one minute. Uh, the dollar uh, uh, um, emerged as the dominant international currency really after World War II um, for the same kind of reasons that English emerged as the dominant scientific language that people use when they talk to uh, social scientists and other scientists from different countries, even though they may not be in the UK or the US at the time. After World War II, the United States was the largest economy in the world, engaged in the most uh, foreign trade and, and, and foreign lending. No other country had deep and liquid financial markets open to the rest of the world. Uh, other countries, in, in, including our our friends in in Western Europe, maintained controls on cross border transactions and only began to deregulate their markets very gradually in the 1980s and 1990s. So the dollar was really the only candidate for this international currency status. And what is interesting is uh, that it demonstrates the advantages uh, of incumbency that the dollar is the in, became the incumbent international currency uh and that status has persisted uh despite uh 
uh, a financial crisis in the United States in 2007, 2008, dis despite uh, the, uh, what some people might call the weaponization of the dollar, U.S. financial sanctions, and it continues to persist, uh, to many people's surprise, and to an extent, uh, in, including my own. You mentioned uh, my 2011 book, Exorbitant Privilege, and uh, my forecast there was that the dollar would lose ground to competitors like the euro and the Chinese renminbi, the currencies of, of the two other largest economies, the euro area and China. But that loss of preeminence has proceeded more, more slowly than I predicted there. Is there, just to follow up quickly, you mentioned a few factors that, that led to the rise of the dollar as that preeminent currency. Um, is there any one factor that you privilege over the others, whether it's the incumbency piece, the world's largest economy piece, some of the rules around regulations and, and um, the uh, liquidity, to use a word that I'm starting to veer outside my lane. Um, are, are there any one of those that, that you think is of particular importance, or is it just that that perfect storm of I, I I think it's like like a good stew. It has a number of ingredients. So the key ones here are size, stability, and liquidity. That has to be the currency of a large economy that is engaged in a lot of cross-border transactions. The currency has to have a reputation for holding its value, stability. And uh, people have to be able to buy and sell it conveniently at low cost without mar moving markets against themselves. And that's what we mean by liquidity. Great. Th thank you for that. Um, Dan, turning to you, what are some of the recent trends that have led to the recent discussions that we're hearing about, about de-dollarization within the international context? Thank you, uh, Courtney, for the invitation. And <clears throat> I just want to start by saying it's really uh, an honor to be on here with uh, Professor Eichen Green, whose uh, work has greatly influenced my own interest in this topic. So that's a real treat. Uh, so yeah, it's a great question. This term de-dollarization, if, if you're someone who doesn't pay a ton of attention to the, the the role of international currencies, might have come out of nowhere in the last couple of years. And I think that's because the primary trigger for interest in this topic was the decision by the United States and its allies to rely heavily on financial sanctions as a tool to respond to the to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Those sanctions included a range of different elements, including uh, full blocking sanctions on large Russian banks, effectively blocking those banks from, uh, uh, from participating in cross-border payments in exchange. I think the most provocative element was the decision to sanction the Central Bank of Russia, which resulted in the freezing of around $300 billion of the country's foreign exchange reserves. Um, I would note that those sorts of moves by the United States are not unprecedented. Similar blocking sanctions and even central bank sanctions have been used by the United States to target other countries before, but Russia really represents uh, a different scale. It's the largest, a country, uh, largest country to be sanctioned in this way. And of course, those sanctions were also rolled out at a moment where the entire world was watching what was happening in Eastern Europe. So I think the salience of the invasion kind of led to more attention to the issue. Um, and then following on that announcement, right, you get a number of high profile experts and observers that are suggesting uh, sort of in public debate that this decision by the United States is going to be consequential, that it's going to provoke a fracturing of the world monetary system as Russia and other countries that are skeptical of U.S. power are going to seek alternative currencies uh, to use in their, their international activities. And so I think the Russia sanctions are key. I, I would say they're not the only reason it's become part of the zeitgeist today. Briefly, I would also say, you know, it, it, it fits within this now dominant narrative uh, that the world economy is undergoing a, a transformation, uh, this decoupling or de-risking between countries, especially those aligned with the United States and those aligned more with China. And so, you know, if, if you think the world is in a period of decoupling in this way, in trade and investment, then why wouldn't we also expect a decoupling in the monetary sphere as well? And so I think that that narrative is part of the reason this has become um, such a, a sort of a popular uh, area of debate today. Thank you. Um, Dr. Eichen Green, could you outline some of the key advantages and challenges associated with the US dollar's role as a strong currency um, 
and you know how have those characteristics evolved over time and do you you know what implications uh, does that hold for its future as a strong dollar in the global economic landscape? Courtney, I, I'm assuming you mean the key advantages that and disadvantages that accrue to the United States in. Correct. Yes. Two. Yes. That that accrued to the United States. Exactly. So number number one, convenience value. It's convenient, uh, and and uh, uh, for U.S. banks and firms to be able to do business with their cross border, with their foreign uh, counterparts, in their own currency, without having to go to a bank and ask for euros or yen or or uh, another foreign unit. Um, in addition, uh, uh, the, it, it gives the United States a little bit of um, geopolitical leverage, as Dan was describing before. The dollar is then then uh, can can be used to a limited extent as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. Um, there are those who argue that the uh, demand abroad for dollars by foreign central banks, foreign governments, uh, foreign commercial banks, uh, allows uh, the US Treasury to issue bonds at a slightly lower interest rate than otherwise, because there is this captive additional demand for those bonds uh, abroad. People who've looked in, in, into this aspect conclude that the impact on 10-year on ten, ten year US Treasury bond yields is a small fraction of one percentage point, maybe 10 or 20 basis points. So this is not a big deal. Um, finally, uh, the fact that dollars are so widely held and used by so many different uh, uh, agents around the world uh, and, and that markets in, in, in dollars are so liquid make uh, the dollar kind of a safe haven for not only uh, U.S. investors, but foreign investors as well. So when a bad thing happens, uh, there tends to be a rush into dollars and, and our currency strengthens, uh, our interest rates go down, or at least they don't go up as much as they might otherwise. E even when we in the U.S. are responsible for that bad thing, like the failure of Lehman Brothers in 2008, the dollar strengthened rather than weakened. It's interesting that since October 7th, we haven't seen those safe haven flows to the same extent. So again, uh, you know, U.S. 10-year U.S. Treasury yields uh, have ticked up rather than ticking down, and the dollar have, hasn't moved much either way. So that kind of um, feeds into to your earlier question and, and Dan's earlier comment uh, uh, question about whether things might be beginning to change. Thank you. That that you you almost pre preempted a question I had, which was whether or not there's uh, if people are prioritizing financial interests over political ones. If um, if you've seen that in the past, but it sounds as though perhaps in the past, but maybe maybe things might be changing. It's interesting. Thank you, um, Dan. Just digging back a little bit into the sanctions question. Um, you know, you in your book you talk about whether sanctions threaten the dollar status as the world's key currency. Could you just dig a little bit more into some of the main findings and insights um, that that you found in that? If having written a whole book on it, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mentioned the you know the the Russia sanctions in 2022 in February uh, of last year. That's I think the the case that's captured the world's attention, but it's. I think it's important to begin here with a brief discussion about the use of sanctions, financial sanctions by the United States, how that's increased quite dramatically over the last two decades. So the, the, the primary way that the United States initiates a new round of financial sanctions is through a presidential executive order, which of course is quite easy for uh, the executive to issue. Um, the executive order directs US Treasury to add an additional group of entities. These can be individuals, uh, these can be foreign firms, these can be foreign government institutions like the Central Bank of Russia, directs Treasury to add that group of entities to effectively what is a blacklist that, that tells all banks operating in the United States that they cannot conduct business 
with any of the entities on that list. And so if you're on that blacklist, you find yourself unable to get a bank to uh, right, process a payment for you, or in many cases, access your, your assets that might be uh, uh, held at that bank. So I mentioned the increasing use of the tool. In the year 2000, there were 22 of these executive orders in place that had a, a sort of a, a tranche of, um, of entities to be added to that list. By the end of last year, so in 22 years, that had increased to 109 active executive orders. So that's like a five-fold increase in the use, um, just counting at the the <laughs> the executive order level. If we actually looked at the the number of S, the the number of targets, it's even in the 10,000s. We could also talk about country targets. In the year 2000, four foreign governments were directly targeted under a U.S. sanctions program. At the end of last year, that had increased to 22. Now, to be clear, not all countries are sanctioned at the same level. They're not all under Russia-style sanctions. But the critical point here is that more than one in 10 sovereign states in the world today is at least experiencing some degree of U.S. financial sanctions. Um, so the basic argument of the book, briefly, is that the more the United States uses sanctions, the more it introduces political risk in the international currency system. What I mean by that is Washington is making its adversaries and foreign capitals more aware of their vulnerability that stems from dependence on the dollar, right? If I use the dollar uh, and in turn U.S. banks for payments cross-border, uh, if I use it um, for, uh, for uh, holding my assets in the dollar, right? Those assets using the dollar for payments are vulnerable to U.S. intervention, foreign policy intervention. So in the book, I document how awareness of that political risk um, has been rising in recent years, long before, I would say, the, the decision by Russia to invade Ukraine. Uh, in fact, the Russians were preparing for that, that sanctions event um, before it occurred. Some governments have responded by implementing what I call anti-dollar policies. They're measures that are designed to reduce their reliance on the dollar. And so not all those measures have failed to, or excuse me, not all those measures have succeeded. Many have failed. De-dollarization is not easy to accomplish. But basically, the book finds a number of things that if you're sanctioned, you're more likely to buy monetary gold on an annual basis than unsanctioned countries. Professor Eichen Green has some work on this as well. Uh, more likely to reduce U.S. Treasury holdings, less likely to use the dollar in trade, and more likely to have a bank uh, join China's uh, own uh, new renminbi-based payment system. So broad patterns suggest that individual uh, countries that are, are targeted by sanctions or at high risk of sanctions are, are likely to seek out alternatives. Again, not always able to, to achieve that, but that's something that we're seeing happening uh, with greater frequency. If I can follow up real quickly, mm -hmm. um, uh, as Dan said, my co-authors and I have looked at these issues empirically as well. I think, uh, Dan, your comments are valuable uh, partly because they point out the difficulty of measuring precisely the incidence of sanctions, who is being sanctioned at what level, and that makes it hard to tease out the impacts. Uh, insofar as we succeeded, we didn't find uh, shifts from using the dollar or holding the dollar to uh, using and holding other currencies, but we did find a noticeable tendency, as Dan said, for um, uh, governments and central banks subject to sanctions to move away from uh, currencies, including the dollar, toward gold. And that's uh, an interesting illustration of the um, limits of the de-dollarization argument. If a central bank like Russia sells dollars and uh, buys gold bars and then repatriates them, puts them on a boat, ships them home and vaults them in St. Petersburg and Moscow, uh, that gold is insulated from sanctions, but can't be used for cross-border transactions can't be used for financial transactions can be used only with the very greatest difficulty to make payments uh in in return for imports so there is scope for de-dollarization again along some dimensions but not others thank you and i i wanted i was about to turn to you dr aiken green with a question about china but before i do actually i'd love to just ask you what is what does an alternative look like? Is there a system where, you know, as we talked about, there could be a fracturing of the payment system? Is it, you know, would it look like a world in which there's just, you know, sort of equal parity given maybe to dollar and euro and then RMB? Um, or or does one eventually, is there is there sort of a um an accumulative effect where 
there needs to be one one main payments type system. I think modern financial technology makes it easier to switch between use uh, 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 of different currencies. Used to be you had to walk down to your bank or or make a phone call to your bank in order to uh, buy and sell currencies. And then you had to wait a while, most of us, before the transaction was complete. Now, now we can all do this using our smartphones all but instantaneously. So um, I think the um, older arguments that uh, the convenience value uh, uh, of using dollars will continue to dominate and crowd out the use of other currencies grows weaker over time, just like Google Translate may undermine the dominance of English. People can write in other languages and I can still read it, uh, courtesy of large language models uh, and, 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 and machine learning. Um, digital money will, will make it easier for the um, global monetary system to become more fractured, to use your language, but um, cross-border transactions to continue to take place. Thank you. So maybe fractured is not quite the right word and diversified, maybe. So, um, thank you for, for that clar clarification. Um, Staying with you, Dr. Aiken Green, your book mentions the Chinese RMB as a currency that has attracted a portion of global reserves. Could you discuss the rise of the RMB as a reserve currency and its implications for the global financial landscape? And sort of what what are the, what is the relative scale and direction of the trends that you are seeing? We are seeing a a, a growing share of cross border transactions being uh, invoiced. In other words, their prices quoted in and settled using the Chinese renminbi. I think Dan referred to this before, but uh, uh, that is mainly China's own trade with other countries. And if you, you try to reconstruct which central banks around the world hold reserves in the form of renminbi, Russia holds about a third of all identified renminbi foreign exchange reserves. So the renminbi remains kind of a niche currency, China's trade, Russia's reserves, because uh, Chinese financial markets are still leagues behind US financial markets in terms of depth and, and liquidity. China maintains restrictive regulations, capital controls on getting money into and out of the country. Um, if you look at interbank transactions between banks, uh, SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Inter International Financial um, Telecommunications, uh, where banks talk to one another and, 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 and move money between their respective accounts, about 3% of all transaction, transactions through, through SWIFT are in renminbi, about 40 to 45% are in dollars. Thank you. Um, and Dan, I know you've worked a lot on China as well. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how China fits into the broader context of global currency dynamics and the potential competition it may pose to the US dollar. Yeah, so I'll, I'll pick up right where uh, Professor Eichengreen left off. I agree with everything uh, that he just said. You know, my, my own view, <clears throat> In terms of what China is after, what China wants, so I think that's important because if you if you read a lot of the stories about uh, renminbi today, it, it's often um, framed as you know China trying to topple dollar dominance as if it's a you know a, a, a contest between the two. I don't think that's actually what China is interested in. My my own view is China wants more financial autonomy from the United States. It wants more resilience in the face of a future potential conflict with the United States, which I think China rightly recognized would almost certainly bring with it uh, financial sanctions. China is paying very close attention to what's happening uh, to Russia, and it sees the writing on the wall, I think. You, you can see this in public discourse among financial elites. Uh, if you would go back seven, eight years ago, remember internationalization was predominantly an economic technocratic debate about the, the, the economic costs and benefits. Today, the, the strategic element is front and center. The Chinese recognize that RMB internationalization is 
critical, again, within reason, RMB internationalization within certain uh, reason is critical to, to sort of Chinese resilience to, to U.S. coercive pressure. So, you know, the, the dollar they recognize can be used against them, right? Um, and historically, China's participation in the world economies relied heavily on, on dollars and, and the dollar-based payment system. So Chinese firms, uh, Professor Eichner was talking about this, generally price and accept payment for their exports in dollars, which means they're relying on uh, American banks, uh, essentially as correspondent uh, accounts, the, the pipes through which these dollars flow. And, and those connections are vulnerable to U.S. foreign policy intervention. So very quickly, what's China doing? It is trying to build its own um, set of independent financial plumbing, if you will, right? A payment network. It's called SIPs. We're, we're using lots of acronyms here. Um, and this is really dry stuff, I guess. But it, it, short for the cross-border interbank payment system, this is China's own, again, a system of financial plumbing banks that are connected around the world. There's something like 1,400 banks in 111 countries that are connected to those pipes. It's been adding around 100 to 200 foreign banks a year. That's a pretty good clip. Now, I will say, not all those banks, we don't really know how many, in fact, I would say probably most of those banks aren't actively using the system, right? They're on the books. Um, but use of SIPs is growing, according to PBOC, that's the Chinese Central Bank data. Daily transactions, according to the bank, have increased from the first quarter of 2020 to the fourth quarter of 2022, threefold. Okay, so that's, that is sizable growth. It still remains a tiny fraction, like Professor Eichner Green was saying, of the dollar system. But China has shifted from around 11% of its total trade being settled in its own currency to now around 30% today. So, uh, you know, bottom line, my view is this is about getting the plumbing in place for a potential sanctions event in the future to, to build in um, better resilience to that pressure, not about toppling dollar dominance. I don't think that's their, their, their goal. Thank you. Um, I'd like to try to get in a couple more questions before turning to the Q&A. And if you're listening and have a question and would like to put it in, you can, uh, if you'd like to ask it, you can put it in the Q&A box. Um, turning to current events, uh, Dr. Aiken Green, um, in light of the ongoing um, terrible conflict in the Middle East, there's a growing concern about whether Middle Eastern oil exporting countries if dissatisfied with US foreign policy might consider shifting away from the US from the use of the US dollar. And you alluded to this earlier. Um, so I'd be curious just to hear your thoughts on what potential implications this could have for the US dollar's dominance. So you'll recall that uh, it was late last year, I think, that uh, Chinese President Xi went to Saudi Arabia and the, and, and the country's respective leaders talked about uh, maybe uh, quoting the, the uh, oil prices in another currency and not the dollar. I thought it was revealing at the time that they didn't offer to accept payment for, uh, Saudi Arabia didn't offer to accept payment for its oil exports to China in the form of renminbi. All of which is to say that I think were uh, OPEC or oil exporters more broadly begin to quote prices in a currency other than the dollar, that would have fewer implications than many people think. Dollar prices of oil go up and down with supply and demand. And if those prices were quoted in euros or, or renminbi instead, the prices would still go up and down day to day um, uh, with supply and demand. So if there were an actual shift in the currencies that oil um, exporters accepted. I think that would be a more consequential change, and we haven't seen much evidence of that yet. Thank you. Um, and Dan, just uh, one final question for you before I turn to the Q&A box. Um, could you just please provide some insights into how U.S. sanctions, um, particularly the ones that we've mm -hmm. been talking about, imposed on Russia in response yeah. to events in Ukraine, have contributed to really strengthening the dollar and offer some specific examples on how hmm. those sanctions influence the financial markets? Um... Well, well, this may not be directly attributable to sanctions, but it, but it may be. I say that because I'm not sure myself, but if we look at you know recent data on the dollar's use, again, to go back to the use of the dollar as a payments currency. So you know, what are uh, our, uh, you know, counterparties using, you know, between third countries, you know, not even involving the U.S., uh, which currency are they using to to price and accept payment for for goods or uh, repayment of debt, et cetera? Um, Swift data. Uh, this is again. This is the the communication lines that banks use to talk to each other. 
records the currency that is requested, right, for payment cross-border. And interestingly, before the war, the dollar accounted for something like 40% of cross-border payments. I think Professor Eichengreen mentioned a number close to that before. Now it's around 48%. It's actually gone up uh, since before the war. Uh, the euro has actually dropped quite a bit. Some of this, Swift says they've changed a little bit. I guess they're, they're how they account for their data. So some of it could be statistical anomalies here or a new way of calculating the total, but probably not all of that. So it does seem like dollar dominance overall has, has increased in the payment space, right? Um, that's separate from the reserve currency role. Um, but at, at the micro level, um, so you know we can think about de-dollarization as this macro trend. I prefer to think of it as sort of country level, even country sector level phenomenon, right? Because I, I don't see the sanctions driven element of this as being something that's going to topple global dollar dominance, but you might see movement in certain areas among certain countries that are hit by sanctions. So I'll just, I'll end with dis discussing Russia, where we have seen clear movement and they frankly don't have a choice, right? Sanctions kind of push the Russian economy out of the, the dollar system. And so we know that today, around 20% of Russia's total trade based on the, the, the most uh, available data, which are, are, are from Russian um, policymakers who are saying these things publicly. So we have to trust trust them. Like 20% of Russia's trade now is settled in RMB. Around 70% of Russia's trade with China is settled in, in renminbi or rubles. Um, Russians are saving more in, in, in the yuan or RMB. Around 11% of total deposits are in, in that currency now. It's the most widely traded currency in the Russian foreign exchange market. Um, and so these are just examples to show what sort of happens to a country that's kicked out of the dollar system. They're going to find alternatives. Those alternatives are not as convenient. Um, they have significant drawbacks. Um, but but that's, I guess, at the micro level, what's happening at the macro level. I don't think we see real evidence of, of declining dollar. In fact, if anything, we see the opposite. Courtney, let me give you one more um, data Please. point from earlier this year that I think is interesting. There were these extended discussions between Russia and India about not using the dollar uh, uh, in settlement of Russian oil exports to India. And those talks broke down because uh, Russia wanted India to pay using Chinese renminbi, because Russia can use those renminbi to buy stuff from China. But India and China are not on good terms, and China wasn't in a position to make its uh, ability to obtain oil from abroad contingent on being able to earn renminbi. So India offered rupees instead, and Russia said, no way. Those are not an adequate substitute for the dollar. We can't imagine that uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff we're going to want to buy from you. So they're still using the dollar so far as we can tell. Great, great example that there are these other bilateral relationships that are impacting things too. So um, thank you. So turning to the Q&A box, we have a question here. I'll um, uh, direct this to you, Dr. Aiken Green, first from someone at the European Council on Foreign Relations who asks if you could please zoom in on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, not just the petrodollar question, but also their active interest to explore diversification from the dollar together with China and to a certain extent, Russia and Iran, including potentially within BRICS while having currencies pegged to the US dollar. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that I have a lot to add to what I said before. Uh, these are countries with uh, big sovereign wealth funds that hold diversified portfolios of assets around the world, including in, in, in different currencies. I don't think their investment behavior would be much affected, as I said before, if all of a sudden uh, we began quoting oil prices in euros or renminbi instead of dollars. Thank you. Um, Dan, turning to you, we have a question here uh, from someone who says, why would we not try to maintain the dollar's unique position? And, and then they also ask, the euro seems to be the real competition, correct? Um, and, that, and then they state that the, uh, that the one doesn't seem to be as available, even though it may be required at some point to use for trade if China pushes that on weaker countries. So there's sort of a couple of questions in here sure. about why would we not try to maintain the yeah. dollar's yeah. unique position? And, and is the euro the real competition? Yeah. So um, on, on the why would we not? I mean, my 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 general take on policymakers in Washington view is that, is that there is 
general generally overall support for a strong dollar, a dominant dollar. Um, there have been hearings at, in in uh, over the last year um, uh, in, in the House and in, in Senate on maintaining dollar primacy. If you you know if you read any quote from uh, Secretary Yellen at Treasury, you you hear the same uh, things you heard ten or twenty years ago. Okay, about a strong dollar and a commitment to to openness. All the things that would be uh, designed to maintain the dollar status. So I think that that is the that is the position. Um, now there are folks who who debate this. Um, I, you know, I, I would be curious. <laughs> I'm not asking Professor Eichen Green this question, but maybe at a different time we could talk about Michael Pettis's argument. He's out there making a strong argument that dollar dominance is actually bad for the U.S. economy for various reasons. I won't get into all the all the the thinking there. It is something I think that's becoming more debated. At least that's my sense today than it was even five years ago, where there are more folks saying there are downsides to having a dominant international currency than. Um, than upsides. Um, my sense is that the, the more common position is still, it's better to have a dominant currency than not. Um, I, I'll just leave it there and say that from the policymaking side, I think the status quo is let's, yes, let's maintain that. Um, as far as the euro is concerned, um, you know, yes, I guess it's the, the, the biggest competitor in that it's the second place currency. Um, but I mean, the, the sort of balance between Euro use and dollar use across various ro roles has been pretty stable over time. Um, if if the Europeans got their act together, had a you know common uh, Euro debt market, maybe then you know they could absorb more international savings, and that would take a, a larger share out of uh, out of the dollars reserve currency role. Um, so far, it doesn't seem like that's happening. So. Um, I, I guess I would say my sense is the euro is probably just, you know, stable at the number two role and not a real threat to topple dollar dominance. The Europeans haven't typically shown an interest in in monetary leadership um, in that way. So I'll, I'll just end it there. Thanks. Um, Dr. Eichengreen, would you want to address that question uh, the, about this idea that there are, you know, potentially more voices that are saying, that are arguing that the U.S. should not be trying to maintain that strong position? Well, those voices have have um, been heard for a long time. I'm reminded of arguments that C. Fred Bergsten made in the 1990s that because of the dollar's dominant position, uh, uh, the dollar was stronger, uh, more overvalued than would have been the case otherwise, and that this was a negative from the point of view of, of the growth of U.S. manufacturing, U.S. export competitiveness, and so forth. Uh, my response to to that would be any such uh, effect and any such downside is small. And if you're concerned about the impact on U.S. manufacturing, there are other instruments like the um, Inflation Reduction Act and the Chips Act that can take on that problem directly. All right. Thank you. Um, staying with you, Dr. Eichen Green, we have a question here that asks. Does China's lack of transparency about the real value of its economy uh, militate against their uh, renminbi as a store value currency? And second part to this, does the level of U.S. debt erode the confidence in the dollar as a store value slash cross-border currency? Yeah, so I do think the issue about um, Chinese transparency and the predictability uh, uh, of Chinese policy is important. Here, people are concerned about uh, how 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 bad the non-performing debt problem is in the property and real estate sector, and what that will mean for local and regional banks in particular. So that creates an understandable reluctance on the part of international investors to park their money in in Chinese banks. And if the government has to print a lot of renminbi in order to recapitalize those banks because um, two big property companies go under. Uh, that can be a negative for the exchange rate or can cause the Chinese government to tighten up on controls that limit access to funds that have been parked in Shanghai in the past. You will have noticed that the Bank of Russia did exactly that yesterday. They tightened their controls because of the weakness of their currency. So I, 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 I think um, it, um, limited transparency of what's really going on in the financial sector more than in, 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 in more than questions about what the actual rate of GDP growth is 
matter here, and also the predictability of policy. So I like to say before the pandemic, uh, when I went to China and I talked on this subject, uh, I would observe that um, every leading international and reserve currency in history is has been the currency of a political republic or democracy, where there is pressure from investors for government to be transparent about its affairs and pressure from investors for government not to change the financial policy regime uh, unpredictably. And my Chinese audience would um, listen to the point respect respectfully. On, on the second part of that question about the level of US debt, um, how, and, and just to, to complicate matters in terms of um, if, um, I guess predictability is an important thing. How does the US political, current political situation play into, um, I mean, I guess now we have a speaker of the house, but um, into confidence, let's say. Yeah, um, I think history shows clearly that there comes a point where debt is so heavy and questions about the ability of a government to service it uh, without resorting to inflation or other um, unconventional means undermines that currency's uh, leading international status. So the pound sterling after World War II became what economic historians like to refer to as a zombie international currency, where it was still held for historical reasons but couldn't be used. Uh, the United States, and in, in my opinion, is still very far from that position. But there can come a point if we continue to run large deficits and have the political gridlock to which you allude for decades where uh, the, the dollar's current status would not survive. Thank you. Um, Dan, turning to you, we have a question here about how much the Belt and Road Initiative has contributed to the increase in the uh, renminbi use for China. From And they, the questioner cites from around 11% to around 30%. So I don't know if those numbers are exact, but you can... Uh... Yeah. No, I think those are the numbers I mentioned earlier, right? So this idea that, that if you look at, again, this is all based on, on chi China's own reporting of the data. That, that in, in 2017, around 11% of China's total trade was settled in, in, in renminbi, and, and today that's close to 30%. Um, so those are um, our accurate numbers. So what role did Belt and Road, Road play in this? Surprisingly, very little. This is interesting. And this is something that, uh, a question I've got before, and it's actually a question, I guess, to some extent I, I have myself. You know, Belt and Road, again, this, this really um, ambitious uh, effort uh, on, uh, from the Chinese part to, to um, uh, have these infrastructure development projects in, in developing countries uh, in, in virtually all regions of the world um, has had a lot of Chinese lending. You know, a lot of Chinese banks, they don't Chinese banks are providing the financing for these projects. Um, and, and what's fascinating is they're, they're providing that financing primarily in dollars. Uh, Early on, uh, there were some some remembi loans, uh, as far as I know, but the the borrowers effectively swapped into dollars, um, and so there there wasn't a lot of demand from the borrower side for borrowing an RMB. So that could be part of it. Um, I did just see an article the other day. I wish I could remember where I saw it. I'm forgetting now. Might have been Financial Times. Um, it was in the financial press that said there there has been an increase over the last uh, few months through Belt and Road in renminbi loans. And that part of that is actually coming because of um, the increasing cost of borrowing dollars because rates are rising in the United States, right? Uh, and so as a result, dollars aren't as cheap as they used to be. And so that could be another factor is that when dollars are super cheap, given the convenience of dollars, these borrowers were like, look, you know, we'll, we'll let you build our, our roads and our bridges, but you know, we, we, we wanna finance it in dollars because there's, there's an appeal there because it's cheap. And again, the convenience overall of that currency. But when dollars get expensive, maybe we will see Belt and Road becoming more of a pathway for RMB internationalization. So we'll be watching that. Um, but so far, no, I think that has played a very small role. Thank you. And, uh, and I'll stick with you, uh, Dan, on the next question. And somebody wants to know about the rise of central bank digital currencies, such as the ECNY, which I believe is China's one. Um, digital currencies such as Bitcoin, Bitcoin and stable coins such as U USDC as potential new settlement networks as an alternative to SWIFT. Mm. Yeah, you know, Professor Eichinger was talking about this earlier. 
clearly technological innovation is the sort of thing that can upset the status quo. Um, so uh, blockchain backed currencies, central bank digital currencies or um, private digital currencies don't rely on correspondent banks. So right, uh, blockchain is its own sort of uh, network recording the ownership and transactions between parties. And so you you can in theory right carve out the the banks that um, tend to be in the United States that gives the U.S. its sanctioning capabilities because it can direct those banks to cut off uh, certain actors from using uh, payments. So in theory, I'm moving to a world of CBDCs or digital currencies could upset U.S. dominance over control of those payments networks. You know, um, right now, I think it's still quite early. ECNY, my sense of this, and again, maybe Professor, I can I'll, I'll let you jump in here when I when I wrap up in a minute. You know, ECNY is mostly about domestic payments. Um, China is involved in some work called wholesale CBDC piloting, um, which is really about banks using digital currencies to process international payments. And so there's something called Embridge, which is you know very early stages, a very small thing that's experimental. Um, so there are signs of, of countries using those things and perhaps concerns about sanctions are part of it. Um, I would just say that I'm right now, I'm, I'm, I'm personally um, a bit agnostic about where this is going because we are in such an early space, but I would say the potential is there for change. But I, I would love to hear what Professor Eichengreed says on, on this. Yeah, I, I, I might use a little bit different language, but reach the same conclusion. So at, at the moment, if you want to uh, use currencies for cross-border transactions, a bank in one country sends an instruction through SWIFT to a bank in another country. And generally, uh, that instruction says uh, um, transfer dollars from one account to another. One could imagine instead that uh, uh, a company or an individual in one country holding a central bank digital currency would simply um, uh, shift that to a wallet of somebody in a different country, or that uh, those central one country central bank digital currency could be traded for another. Uh, and Daniel described the kind of the platform that. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements and the People's Bank of China and others have been experimenting with to do this. Embridge stands for multiple central bank digital currency bridge. So we know how to build these platforms in digital space using blockchain or another similar technology, but we don't know how to govern the resulting platform, who makes the rules, who decides who gets to transact, who does the compliance, know your customer, anti-money laundering stuff. Uh, I like to uh, refer to the difficulty we have in governing world trade, deciding the rules for the World Trade Organization. This would be an order of magnitude more complicated. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Eichengreen, sticking with you, we have a question here, um, and the questioner asks, is there any chance of the BRIC company of the BRIC countries developing their own currency as a block? No. <laughs> I, you know, the BRIC countries are a heterogeneous group. We've seen how much uh, difficulty over more than half a century uh, the Europeans had in developing a single currency. Uh, they have their differences, but they are a more homogeneous grouping economically, financially, and politically than the BRICS. Makes sense. Um, Dan, turning to you, uh, we have a question here. Um, the questioner writes, Russian sanctions have not been as effective as hoped by the Biden administration or the EU. Were their expectations unrealistic? Or has Russia been more effective at developing workarounds than expected? And lastly, what could be done now to make those sanctions more effective? Great, great question. Um, the first thing I would say in terms of, you know, we're, we're hopes too high. You know, sanctions were never uh, a panacea or a silver bullet in this case, right? Sanctions were, in, in, in this is beyond financial sanctions, right? Ex, uh, export controls, uh, other uh, economic sanctions, including, you know, uh, banning the import of Russian oil into the U.S., were part of the response. But then, of course, lethal aid to Ukraine was the, the second, probably more important component of this. We're, we're hopes a bit high. You know, if you look back, 
President Biden said, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, reduce the ruble to rubble. There was a significant devaluation following the, the invasion and the sanctions, but then it very quickly recovered. That was a result of uh, policy responses from uh, the Russian state. Of course, Professor Eichengreen mentioned capital controls before. We're seeing this again today. So effectively what they're doing, right, Russia still exports a lot of energy to the world and still has hard currency flowing into the Russian economy. And it can require its inner, its exporters, and these are mostly right um, companies that dig things out of the ground and sell them to the world, and then earn dollars or euros uh, for, for those sales. Then Russia can require those firms to effectively uh, sell dollars and buy rubles to prop up the value of, of the ruble. And so that is a, a pretty effective strategy. There are other um, elements of policy responses as well, interest rate hikes, essentially to sort of try to pull capital back into Russia. And those have been effective. Now, those come at costs, right, to the Russian economy, but they have been able to stabilize the exchange rate. Beyond that, you know, other, you know, what are some other reasons the sanctions maybe haven't been as strong? The first thing I would say is, um, you know, and Ken Rogoff and some other folks have written on this publicly, the Russia sanctions, while while very harsh, are not Iran level um, in terms of their uh, their severity. So, not all Russian banks were sanctioned, okay? Some of the major ones were, but many large Russian banks were left out of the sanctions. Even Russian banks like Gazprom Bank that were sanctioned had carve-outs for energy payments, of course, which is the basic, that's the whole reason Gazprom Bank exists, is to process energy payments. So there's a lot of room for leakage. Of course, that was because the Europeans needed to be able to, to buy Russian energy. So to get the Europeans in, you have to like leave these weaknesses in place in terms of the, um, the, 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 uh, the strength of the sanctions. And so that's a, a big part of it. In terms of what could be done, you know, the United States could move to an Iran style approach, which would be using secondary sanctions. What does that mean? That means that not only are you banning, you know, American banks and banks operating in the, in the US from conducting transactions with Russian uh, interests, you tell banks in any country in the world, if we find out that you, including a Chinese bank, are doing business with Russia, we'll cut you out of the dollar system. Now, the United States could do that if it wanted to. It did that with Iran, and the European banks withdrew from Iran, okay? But that comes at a great cost because the Europeans got quite upset with the United States when we forced their hand. The Chinese would, of course, recoil at the United States telling Chinese banks whom they can do business with. So there isn't an easy solution, right? All of these moves to make the sanctions more, strengthen the sanctions could come at some other costs. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eichengreen, we have a question here. The questioner writes, in my understanding, there have been large dollar sales recently, uh, for example, from China. Do you have preliminary evidence as toward the official holders share versus private holders? And can they be interpreted in light of geoeconomic fragmentation? Or is this more of the classical sensation driven narrative? Yeah, so there are people who spend the, the greater part of their careers trying to reconstruct what the People's Bank of China holds and why and 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 why uh, the value of, of dollar reserves may be moving around. Uh, Brad Setzer is my guru on such matters. Uh, and I, I I think what comes out of his work and the work of others is that China's uh, overall foreign exchange reserves have fallen a bit in recent years because the renminbi has been weak for the same reasons that the Chinese economy has been relatively weak, lockdowns and, and, and now structural problems. So they have used some of their reserves to prop up their currency, and that includes some of their dollars. Uh, the other thing they've done for reasons that are not obvious is they have shifted from U.S. Treasury bonds into uh, the bonds of US agencies, Fannie and Freddie. So it's not clear that they are holding fewer dollars, but the form in which they're holding them seems to have changed. And I would have to uh, defer to Brad and to Dan and to whomever else wants to chime in to uh, try to explain why, why they're doing that. No, no further insight, Dan. I'd like to know too, um, and 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 like Professor Eichengreen, I I pretty much read everything Brad writes on this, and uh, he, he's doing great work. Great. So we have a good recommendation for for someone to go to go look to. Um, in the few minutes we have remaining, I'd love for each of you just to address, and Dan, I'll start with you on this one. Um, what are some 
key indicators that you look for when just trying to understand um, what is happening with the dollar? Um, is it, are you know, are you looking at a very specific financial indicator? Or are you looking at the overall political situation? And what are some of the things that you're really just keeping an eye on right now? Well, I mean, if this, if we're we're talking about sort of where can folks go to um, to just get some basic information about uh, the dollar's use globally, uh, if we're talking reserve currency role, the IMF um, quarterly, I think, publishes what's called the COFR database. Um, I'm not going to try to remember what COFR exactly means because I'm sure I'm going to get something wrong. But if you just C O F E R I M F, if you Google that, you go right to the IMF's webpage and you can see. Uh, quarterly data showing the share of reserves held in uh, in in various uh, currencies, and and that's updated. Uh, and so I look at that. Um, right, uh, I mentioned earlier SWIFT data. Uh, so SWIFT again, the the communications lines that banks use publishes uh, monthly um, data on uh, uh, the use of various currencies for payments. Uh, people can just Google RMB tracker and you can go to the SWIFT website and you can download a PDF and see this month what share of payments is in RMB, what share is in dollars, what share is in euros, uh, what share of trade financing is in various currencies. So all that data is out there that that folks can, can get access to. Um, in terms of what I'm watching beyond those sort of big indicators, which I pay attention to, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the sanction story, as you know. And so I've been spending as much time trying to look at Russian media and reports to figure out what Russia is doing and how they're adapting and what role that might play in, in promoting um, other currencies like the RMB, at least in bilateral relations. So, um, but that's that's my short answer, I guess. Thank you, Dr. Eichen Green. Yeah, I look at the look to the same indicators. What's both interesting and frustrating about them is that they're. Uh, provided at very different periodicities. So you can get uh, information on the dollar exchange rate, of course, tick by tick, second by second. If you want to know about interbank transactions through SWIFT, month by month. Uh, if you want to know about uh, the currency composition of official foreign exchange reserves, COFR data, that's quarter by quarter. If you want to know about turnover in the foreign exchange market, how much are different currencies being traded for one another. That's from the Bank for International Settlements. Once every three years, they conduct a survey. So we're all in the business of trying to piece together data points that come out at different frequencies. Fair enough. Okay. Well, well thank you for um, give, giving some of the, the ingredients that you look at in the overall stew. So um, with that, I just I want to say thank thank you both for a fascinating conversation, um, and the audience as well for participating, and for everyone for being tolerant of the fact that this is not my area of expertise. So, um, but we got through it. So thank you. And um, with that, I just wanted to just uh, say a few words about Network Twenty Twenty. We are a nonprofit. If you participated, wait, I re reversed my things. Our upcoming event. We talked about de-risking. We have an event on de-risking China next week. So this is the same time next Wednesday um, where we'll be talking about economic and business implications. Uh, so please join that. And then um, we do have another event on the digital battlefield and AI's influence on more modern warfare. Um, so, so thank you if, uh, if you want to participate in that. And lastly, I hope that everyone can, um, if you enjoyed these events, I hope that you will support Network 2020. We are a nonprofit and we rely on donations to keep these programs open. So thank you, um, Dr. Eichen Green, Daniel, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you to everyone for participating. <laughs>